this work has been undertaken by Ames and collaborators over the last couple of years um, in response to the recent bleaching events. And um, it's also funded by uh, the NISP Water Quality Hub as well. So just to get everyone on the same page, um, spatial variability of bleaching um, occurs for a number of reasons. There's species um, variability, there's acclimatisation and adaption, uh, water velocity, um, but this talk is mainly going to focus on the thermodynamics with regard to evaction of water and mixing processes. So what happened um, in 2016 is that we had quite low cloud cover, weak winds, so doldrum type conditions, and we had a less active tropical cyclone season, so the waters near the coast kept quite warm. Then in 2017 we had another bleaching followed up. It wasn't as intense, but it was just as significant in that um, it actually occurred outside an El Nino, so that was a bit of a surprise, but that's the new normal. Um, so all of this is happening um, when we have a, a gradually warm climate, and so that's what we have to deal with. But um, when you look at the response along the GBR, there's a latitudinal gradient, and the main reason for that was the local winds or the weather. And certainly in 2016, it was very much about the, um, the winds associated with far field tropical cyclones. <coughs> so before Winston, uh, there was the tropical cyclone Tatiana, and what that does is set up very strong southeast trade winds along the southern GDR. <coughs> and so that's what kept that region cool that year. Then Winston came in and helped it along again. Then in 2017, in late March, where the southern GBR was starting to bleach, um, we also had tropical cyclone Debbie. So we're actually using Himawari at 10 minute intervals to start looking at cloud cover, which is another factor in what causes bleaching. So we can look at each reef and get a, a cloud cover 10 minute time series from it from now on. So obviously when a cyclone category five actually crosses the reef, it does more damage than potentially the bleaching itself. So the emphasis is on um, having remote ones that you know, help, help the situation, not make it worse. I want to cover off on circulation. Um, we basically have a, a westward flowing southern equatorial current that breaks up into a number of jets and forms the East Australian current flowing to the south and then the Hiri current flowing to the north. Now what that means is you have high sea level to the uh, left of the EAC if you're looking the way it's going and so what that means is you have low sea levels at the coast but what happens with the thermocline is it does the mirror image. It actually lifts up and makes cooler water much more available to those outer shelf reefs and that's an important mechanism that will keep the southern GBR persistently cool into the future. However, the northern GBR is the exact opposite, so we would expect less cool water to be available. However, we got a much better response than what that picture tells you, and that's partly due to um, favourable bathymetry. Uh, the physics and the geology drives the biology, and so what we have is, is good deep water channels on the eastern Torres Strait. So if any water does come up from depth, it's got, it can use those channels to access that outer shelf region. So we've seen, known this for quite some time, it's in the climatology, it's persistently cool, that's an ocean current SST image during March 2016, and there's still a persistent cool spot all along those outer ribbon reefs. So E-reefs can model that, it has tides in it, and you'll see every spring and neap cycle, you'll see persistent cool water in the outer region. Another factor is we have a lot of eddies. 
So we don't just have a constant flow of a boundary current, but we have these eddies embedded within that flow. And so they can also affect the thermocline and what's available at the shelf break. There's been a number of studies by the French Histova um, looking at the seasonality of these. Um, they can rotate clockwise and anticlockwise. But when you get a favourable rotation, such as we had in November 2015, where we have a high sea level in the Gulf of Papua, normally we have a low level one. And this is, that actually means that we actually have a polewood flowing current. So the Gulf of Papua current has reversed as a result of this eddy. And that means it will provide much more cool water along that outer reef edge. And that persisted into, this is December, but it persisted into January and February. It also happened this year. So these things happen not regularly, but quasi-periodically so that we actually do have some reversals in that region and importantly in summer that's one of the key reasons we're getting extra cooling in that region. Ames has a number of different observing um, programs out there from in-water surveys to instruments. I'm going to take you through a few of those. We have IMOS that support the Queensland Integrated Marine Observing System. And what I'm going to show you is some of the fixed infrastructure, which is mooring data, but also the gliders, which um, is going to have another talk soon. Um, that's just something we, E-Reefs, helped funded 13 missions during 2016, which coincided with the event, and we got data like that. So the sad thing about that is that the entire shelf from top to bottom was very hot, so there was no um, cold water at depth that could be mixed up. In 2017 we had a similar looking event, but we did see some water creep up onto the shelf itself. So now I'm going to show you the fixed infrastructure. We have hundreds of temperature loggers up and down the GPR, and we also have the IMOS moorings, which have temperature loggers through the water column. Admittedly it's fairly sparse, but at least it gives an idea of what's happening in the regions we're at. So this is six months of temperature data for, uh, 65 metres deep and we're going from October to April and you can see in March and April it's just hot all, all the way down throughout the water column. So there's a bit of a suppression of that those cool water intrusions that you can see through the rest of the year. Good thing about IMOS is it's a sustained observing system, so we can go back many years and look at the variability and the suppression of those cold water intrusions over time, so that we can understand how regular these are and, and how much of an impact they can make over time. A lot of people are showing maps of cool water, satellite imagery. I want to take you through the water column and help explain what's causing a temperature response or stratification in the water column. So what you're seeing here is actually a picture of turbulence. So uh, along the top, you're actually seeing winds, strong and weak and strong again, and how far they're mixing down in the water column. At the bottom, you're actually seeing the spring <coughs> tidal cycle. So each spring flood, you'll have a peak along the bottom. So winds mix from top down, tides mix from the bottom up. And that's the temperature um, profiles you'll get from, from that mixing. And you can see it's very strongly related to the, the wind and tide. So they're the key operators that, key um, physical mechanisms that control the temperature or stratification throughout the water column during bleaching events. So we've also done it at Myrmidon in, in 2002, and you can see there were two peaks. The wind picked up, it mixed the hot water down throughout the water column, but then the winds backed off and it started warming again, and that resulted in another bleaching. So um, what we want to do through the NEST project is to look in the third dimension, look through the water column, and determine how much stress is at what depth. 
So most people recognise the NOAA um, hotspot products that tell you where the heat stress is. Well, we can do the same thing if we have a climatology that goes in the vertical and we can produce a similar sort of product in three dimensions. Same with the degree of heating weeks. How long has that coral uh, suffered um, anomalously warm temperatures? So that's what we're aiming to do. There are other mechanisms on the GBR um, where we have strong tidal currents, we have channeling, and you can see here what it's doing is stirring up the, tidal, the sediments off the bottom, and you can see little eddies coming from those channels. So that's another key mechanism that will mix up that water column, the channeling of the tidal flows. And so we have a whole range of scales, not just large scale ocean basin currents, but all these eddies at different scales. So we've got a little poem there. Big wells have little wells that feed on their velocity, and little wells have lesser wells, and so on to viscosity. <laughs> so we can prioritise all these things. We've got Reynolds numbers that we can look at, um, and that helps us understand under certain flow conditions what sort of <coughs> circulations we'll get behind reefs. So the reefs themselves help mix the water column. So these are the things we want to map at high resolution. E-reefs can do that, especially when we nest it down to another model called Recom, where we look at individual reefs that Mark Baird has talked about. So we can compare sub-reef scale temperatures that we model <coughs> with actual bleaching response from your water surveys. So for example, off Heron Island, um, we've looked at High resolution, sorry, that's missing. That's a shame. But what that was going to show you is um, the tidal ponding over a few tidal cycles of, uh, of at Heron Island, so that during the day you see as, it, as you get a low tide, it ponds and heats up significantly. So you can look at intra lagoonal um, responses. So one thing to remember is that um, we are going to have changes in the major current systems. This is um, an OFAM model uh, that's been run for, well, the first one on the left is from 86 to 2005, but then um, it's also looking in, into the future 2082 to 2101. Two minutes. So what you're seeing there is um, an increase in the Hiri current, um, and the one on the right is the difference. So where it's red, it's stronger, and we've got a bit of a decrease of the East Australian current. So these are things that we need to think about um, what sort of impact they'll have under a future warming climate. Thank you very much.